um, thank everybody for joining us uh, for this conversation. Uh, this is a much needed conversation based upon everything that's going on in the world. Um, and me and Ashley have been wanting to do something together and, and this created like the perfect time to really blend what she does and what I do. Uh, my name is Joshua Mundy. I am uh, not really, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, a local entrepreneur here, uh, just looking to make changes and do things that's great for the community. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be having this great conversation with some awesome, awesome dope people that I know uh, that I felt that could really express uh, how we feel, uh, can really express the state of the black man, because it's really, if you look at in the world, if you look at just TV in itself, man, it's just trauma uh, as, coming from a black man. So when you, when you turn on the TV, you see another black man getting killed. You never see justice. Uh, you look on TV, you see, uh, you know, black men not able to be employed, black men, all these different things that are in these uh, stereotypes that have been stared against black men. And we just really wanted to create dialogue and conversation on how do we address the trauma? Because it's really, uh, it's really trauma when you just turn it on and see that every single day and then really don't have an outlet to express yourself or an outlet to really uh, share with other black men about how are you feeling? Uh, so we wanted to really just create this avenue to do that tonight. Uh, so again, thank you all so very much for joining. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Ashley. Uh, she is with Trulu, we Trulu Wellness. Is that what I'm saying that right, right? Yes. Huh? Triluna. That is Triluna Wellness. Uh, it's a really, really uh, dope organization that uh, brings wellness to corporate corporations. And uh, we met probably probably four months ago. I did a supper club conversation with them, and it was so amazing. Um, there, she's a very awesome thought leader in the in the community, and uh, I let her finish the introduction. So, welcome. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you everyone for being on here again. It was very important for us to create a space to start the conversation. I mean, I'm a natural born healer with my yoga background. And I, I know that we create these spaces in our Triluna community, I mean, which mainly consists of women. Um, but, you know, we as women, it's easier for us to share our stories, share these different types of dialogue. And I really, um, like I was telling every, all the gentlemen that was on here um, while we were getting ready, that I needed to think of a leader in the community that I could team up with that would allow men to show up and be vulnerable to, um, you know, ask questions around, you know, starting the healing process. Because like Josh said, it's a lot of buried trauma that has been there for years that we were born into. And so what we wanted tonight to be more about is asking the direct questions, starting the conversation. All the gentlemen that we have on the panel today will be wonderful resources for you, not only just while we're here in this space, but I mean, I encourage you after this to follow them. We have Eric Capehart, who is a professional counselor. We have Aaron McGee, who is a podcast host and Michael Warren who is also an author and speaker and of course Josh and before we get started in true Triluna fashion and my yogi fashion we're gonna start with a breathing meditation and this is going to be a simple breathing meditation that you guys can do at any time of the day if you feel anxiety if you feel overwhelmed if you can't sleep at night I know all of our sleep has been very, very strange right now with what's been going on in the world. So hopefully these, uh, this resource will be valuable uh, for you to not only do tonight, but to take with you. So you can choose to close your eyes. If you're sitting in a chair, just sit back and get comfortable. You can close your eyes or you can find a soft gaze towards the ground, whatever you do. I just want everyone just to take a really big breath in through your nose and exhale, sigh it out of the mouth. 
again, big inhale in. And when you breathe in, I want you to imagine filling your lungs and your chest up like a balloon with air. And then exhale, sigh it out. Last one, big inhale in, fill up. And then we exhale, sigh it out. And this time we're going to inhale for one, two, three, four, and hold. And exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Inhale, one, two, three, four, and hold. Exhale, five, four, three, two, one. Last round, inhaling for one, two, three, four, and hold. Take one more sip in. And exhale, five, four, three, two, one. I want everyone to take the biggest, fullest inhale that you've taken all day long, holding at the top. And I want you to take a moment and gather all of that extra stuff that you've been carrying around. And on the exhale, we choose to release. We choose to let go. One more breath in. And exhale, side out. You can start to slowly open the eyes and bringing your attention back to the screen. And so one of the most important things that I want all of you gentlemen to know is that our breath and our sleep are two important things that we, we can't live without. So making priority to do breathing exercises and making sure that you're getting the rest that you need. So with that said, we'll go jump right in. And my first question, I'm going to direct it to Eric because Eric comes from a counseling background. I felt like this was real direct. <laughs> and so my question to you, Eric, is why do you feel it's hard for black men to identify with trauma? Well, that's a good question to start this thing off with. Um, and again, welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, that's a question that um, I'm asked a lot. And uh, I think the, uh, there's many reasons. Um, there's systemic reasons, um, there's stigma involved, and there's also historical reasons. But I wanna kind of focus in on like, and I'm just speaking freely, like I'm not, I mean, I am a counselor, but I just wanna talk to everybody as if I'm talking to my friends tonight. I think one of the biggest reasons that um, it's hard for us to necessarily address our trauma is because I feel like we we've normalized it as a society. Um, we've and and then we 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 make it seem as if talking about trauma is a weakness. You know what I'm saying? We're supposed to be masculine. We're supposed to be able to handle anything that comes to us. Be the provider, stand up, and just handle anything that comes to us. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily fit with the narrative. You know, when you start to talk about, well, hey, I feel hurt because of this experience that I may have witnessed or something that I may have heard happen or something that may have happened to me personally. Um, that doesn't necessarily fit with the masculine uh, with the masculine story. And so I think that is one of the reasons that stops men from even wanting to address it. I see it like especially now during this COVID, um, most of my new clients and I'm a counselor for what we call it social justice. Uh, I'm seeing a, a lot of black men who are coming to me because they're dealing with not only the current trauma that Josh mentioned earlier, like what's happening every day, but things that have happened in their, in their own lives in the past that's starting to affect them today that they didn't realize was um, having, or they didn't realize it would have such a tremendous impact today. And so I think when we started talking about why is it so hard for us to address trauma, I think it's because we've normalized it. Oh, this is just a part of being a man. I can handle this, it'll be okay. Um, another, another thing I want to talk about is the historical component. Um, you know, if you think about 
this is, I like to say this a lot. If you want to know why a thing is the way that it is today, look at the history of that thing. Throughout history, um, the medical profession and people of color, it, we, there's not a good relationship there. There's, a, there's an earned distrust. I mean, most of us can think of the Tuskegee Airmen um, experiment and those types of things. Those build a, a, a distrust in the community. And so for, for, its, for years, uh, a black, just for an example, a black man could just be pulled off the street, you know, and then put into an insane asylum against his own will, treated, drugged up and kept there for so long for no reason, you know, uh, maybe only because he's just a black man. Um, you think about when, when black Americans or Africans first came to this country and, and we had slavery and when you tried to escape slavery, that was actually a mental health disorder if you actually wanted to escape slavery. And so that was considered a mental health uh, disorder. And so I think there is, and then of course we have the, the reason um, that people, black people in particular, especially black men don't address trauma is because uh, financial reasons, maybe they, maybe we don't have insurance or maybe we just can't afford therapy. So those are three reasons that I think um, black men are, you know, reluctant or somewhat apprehensive to really even address the trauma. It's because of the social stigma, it's the historical component and also maybe for financial reasons. Let, uh, Eric, I'm just going to kind of flow with yeah. this. So Eric, in it's regards flowing. to like um, the therapy piece, like it's just been a really like a lot of talk about men really embracing therapy. What is that, yeah. where is that, where is that coming from now that more black men are feeling comfortable with therapy? Because, you know, therapy in the black community means that you're crazy, you know, like, right. like you, <laughs> you got like a problem, like you're insane, yeah. but not really like therapy as in let me reflect and let me go talk about or ha sit down with somebody. So like, how, how has that shift been where now the culture is really starting to embrace uh, therapy? Man, what I'm seeing is um, a lot of men who are coming to me, they're coming because maybe their, their girlfriends or their wives, you know, may have recommended it. You know, here's, mm -hmm. I found this good therapist. You may want to talk to him because there are some issues going on. And I think that's a great, you know, <laughs> kind of segue into therapy. And I, that's why a lot of, I think, uh, at least what I do, even though I'm a therapist, most of my men, most of the men in my practice, most of my clients are men. I target women because the women are the ones that kind of push men towards therapy. And so mm -hmm. my podcast, everything that we do, we keep in mind that most people who are going to consume this is probably going to be a black woman. And so we want to make sure that we are encouraging them to encourage the, the men in their lives to come. Josh, man, like every, just about every client that has come to me over the last few months is a black man. And I asked him, how'd you hear about me? Oh, my girlfriend saw you on Facebook or she was in a group or something. And, you know, we were talking about this. And I think that's what the, I think that's a part of the shift in the culture. And then also men are just tired of hurting, bro. Let's just keep it 100. Like we are actually physically hurting. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. you have this stress and this trauma, it actually physically hurts. And then you go to your doctor and your doctor says, oh, this is just because of stress. Your, your vitals are good. Your heart's cool. All this pain that you're experiencing is, is from stress. And so I think that's also leading men to um, come and find a therapist. And then it's kind of like the cool thing to do, Josh. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you know this. Um, if one person makes it seem cool, if you have celebrities, athletes coming out and speaking about this, it's kind of like glamorized, and which is cool to me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's, it's, that's what's playing into the culture shift to where men, especially us, are seeing therapy as an option these days. Yeah. Yeah, we had Terrence comment. He said, it seems like an old stereotype about therapy has changed a lot. And um, I have to agree. I mean, I got all of you guys here. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this, when men come to my practice, I automatically mm -hmm. address the stigma. There's no point in me, like, not even talking about the stigma. And I'll mm -hmm. ask them, I, you know, we're in the middle of a session, or maybe at the end, or maybe even at the beginning, I'll ask them, do you feel weak right now for doing this? And they're like, no, nah, not really. <laughs> so I'm, I'm addressing that whole stigma right then and there and letting them know that it's not a sign of weakness. I actually think going to therapy is an is a, is a act of vulnerability. And to me, vulnerability is an accurate measure of courage. It takes a, mm -hmm. a certain level of courage to go talk to another man about your own personal issues and so I think vulnerability is, a, is an act of courage and, and we got to smash the stigma that you're weak. I really truly believe that if you know you need help, you know you're struggling and you refuse to get help, to me, that's a sign of weakness. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that's, 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 that's real, man, because I mean, 
a lot of men, we carry so much and we're responsible with, for so much, but really don't have a great way to like channel and get that mm-hmm. off of you. You know what I'm saying? So we've been really talking to our boys or whether it be the barbershop or whatever, but really talking to a professional would really just kind of put things in perspective, you know, and, mm-hmm. and can really, you know, they can really craft it in a way that makes you understand it better than your homeboy telling you, man, now nah, you need to, man, hey, you need to lead that woman, man. man she well, that's, crazy. That's, that's the blind leading the blind a lot of times. <laughs> Most times, man, I just, I utilize a, a technique just called talk therapy, just letting the bros talk. You know what I'm saying? Most of the men, they don't have like deep psychological issues. We all have some level of anxiety, especially right now, maybe some depression, but, men are not coming to me with like severe psychological or emotional issues. They just really need someone to talk to that's outside the circle that can just give, you know, maybe I don't, sometimes I don't have to say anything. You know, I'm just like, yeah, I feel that. I can understand that, you know? And I'm like, was this helpful? They're like, yeah, man, this is real helpful just to have somebody to talk to. And so you're right, Josh. And I do think there's some value in just going to the barbershop and talking. Yeah. I think that's, that's helpful as well. If you can be vulnerable. Um, but like you said, sometimes you need to have a professional involved in your life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a good segue into, um, for you, Josh, I mean, it, it may be the same type of answer, but once the man, once a man gets into that therapy chair, sometimes it's not as easy for some people to flow and just need someone to talk to. But that's the whole emotional part of it. When you get there, why is it, another challenge to express emotions is it is it does it go back to the whole stereotype and men are weak or uh you know we, we've been taught you know uh, you've been taught a lot of different things growing up as a man you know so it's like in good good ways and bad ways so good habits and bad habits that you've been taught brought up you know so whether it be from hey you know, you need to have five or 10 women, not one woman, you know, it's like so many different things that we've been taught that really it, it compounds on the trauma. So it's like, how do I express or how do I get all of these bad habits or all of these, these, well, I would just say the bad habits, like how do I express them? How do I get them in a way where, or who I feel comfortable with talking to some of the things that I don't really like to talk about, uh, you know, and just really finding that safe space. And I think that's really what's important is finding a safe space where you can really, really, you know, take down the guard because we, we always, we always want to put up a guard. And when it comes to expressing ourselves, when it comes to, we don't want to, you know, your perception of me, I don't want you to change your perception of who you think Josh is. So I'm not going to give you, the real weak Josh, I want to give you the happy Josh, the, mm-hmm. the smiling Josh, like everything is okay, but really I'm suffering, you know, really, you know, I'm dealing with trauma and I, and I have to figure out ways to really get it off of me. So let's just speak on my, tro- my trauma. So March the 3rd, literally wiped my slate clean in, in, in an hour and well, it's in 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, you know, spent 12 years of my life at going to one particular location, you know, making great, great money, uh, you know, doing exactly what I want to do, being able to provide a service to the community, also provide a safe space for black entrepreneurs, uh, launching a tech company from that corner. North Nashville has historically been the black area and I wanted to be the beacon of hope that, sits right there on the corner and that all gets wiped away in an hour. So it's like, yo, how do you process that? How Mm. do you get to the point where, hey, you know, because I immediately start thinking about, well, man, what I'm going to do, you know? Not not like, how I'm going to take care of my family? Like, you start thinking about all those different things and then just the weight of the world just sits on you and then you're like, okay, well, how do I how do I express? How do I get this off of me? So what I started doing is, is that I started to walk and work out every single day. Mm-hmm. And just that simple talk or that simple time of me just carving out a time or hour out of my day 
to really just reflect and have conversation with God has really helped me along this journey. I probably could have sat on somebody's couch and Eric offered me several times to say, Josh, come <laughs> talk to me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, you know, it's like, I just took that time to really just like self reflect and just really get a sense of like hearing from God. Like I, I really wanted to take that time cause I've been busy for like 16 years and really ain't had time to just sit back and not do anything. So like this has been the greatest time for me just being able to just sit back and do nothing and just hear from God, reflect, go work out, go ride my bike, go create, and then just, you know, just be in my thoughts and, and figuring out and just coming to like some type of resolution when it comes to that trauma of losing it all. Uh, so it, it's been, it's been a helpful, it's been a helpful time for me. Was you going to say mm -hmm. something, Aaron? No, man, I'm just tapped in. Oh, I'm yeah, I'm up. I thought you were seeing up. Okay, okay. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to say this. So, uh, I think another reason it's hard for men to really express their emotions is because we don't know the words to use. I was going to say uh, that, yep. I use, um, in, in my therapy, I, I would, I'll pull out the feelings chart. You know what I'm saying? All right, how do you, I'll say, how do you feel? Oh, I feel good. I feel fine. Okay, cool. And then I pull out this feelings chart with all these other feelings and emotions on it. And then we began to explore like, oh, you feel uh, resentment or you feel hurt or you might feel isolated. I mean, mm -hmm. once you realize all the different words that you can use to describe how you feel, I think it, that's a first step in making it easier for you to express how you feel. And then I teach a little uh, easy statement. You, it's it, most of any therapist that's on here. I see some therapists on here. You probably do this. The way you express your emotions is you identify how you feel first. And then you say, I feel isolated because whatever the reason is so you do mm -hmm. i feel whatever that emotion is because whatever whatever the trigger is and so i think that's one of the main reasons especially for us as men we don't know we don't know the, the range of emotions that we only know we feel good or we feel bad right <laughs> and so once you see that there's more ways to feel i think that's a great step in uh, being able to express how you feel so eric i would say also uh, i think the two things like what i just heard from both uh, you and josh was just uh, is this education, like just getting educated on like what trauma is, getting educated on like what's the language I can use to identify how I'm feeling and everything. But then also one thing that I feel like is important in putting into the uh, mix here is just the trust factor, Yeah, you know, is that, uh, you know, to Josh's point, you know, I may have this stuff that I want to talk about, you know, and in my work, what I found is that when you can create that safe forum, like you'd be surprised what you can get out of men, you know, particularly brothers. You know, and so Ashley, to your earlier point, we opened up and we were talking about why do women uh, tend to be the conduit for this stuff? I think it's that because that's who we tend to trust, like with, with our vulnerabilities, like we'll trust our girl, you know, and we'll, but we, and, and oddly enough, we may even trust, like you said, that celebrity. If there's somebody that we're, that we put a lot of stock in, that we admire that person and we see that that person's going to get therapy, well then indirectly, that's a way of that person giving me permission to go ahead and do it for myself. Awesome. I, love you know, it. I hate that. But yeah, uh, so I think, Aaron, uh, this is for you, man. So uh, being a father, uh, being a, a business owner, um, like how, how do, being a husband, like how do you carve out time for your own personal mental health? Like, you know, only thing that so men has always been like short, shorted on everything. So Father's Day, you're going to get the raggedy tie. You know what I'm saying? The only thing you get in the house is the big piece of chicken. Like nothing else really matters about you. You know what I'm saying? So, so like, like, like how do you carve out time to really, you know, focus on your mental health? I know a lot of things pull at you. You're responsible for your household. You're responsible for paying all the bills, all this and like, how, how, how do you release? Man, well, first of all, you're asking the right person that question, yeah. uh, but I'm not sure that you're going to get the right answer because I'm, I'm a unique person and, you know, I show up uh, as I am even in my household. So what's, what's really interesting is um, I'll share this, guys, you take what you want to take from it. But, uh, you know, my mental space and my mental health is like one of the most utmost important things to me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I... The way the way I operate, man, honestly, is 
or let me take one step back. Most people know, like if you follow me on social media, I see some of my, my people on here, they follow me and I post almost everything, you know, from my workouts to my runs to I skate. When we weren't in this area, in this, uh, this, this COVID era, uh, you know, it's live events, concerts, going out. So just living a really active life, right? Um, and so I have those type of outlets that allow me to just unwind, decompress, be present in the moment. Um, but the reality is I, I do think that for um, outside of all of those actual activities, man, um, one, one of the things about me is that uh, I, I'm a night owl, but I'm also like an early bird. And so um, I think it's important for us to, especially all of those titles that you uh, identified on me, whether that's husband, father, uh, business owner, contractor, all of the above, I have all of these things pulling on me in the daytime. And just to be honest, like if, if Aaron is not healthy, if, if Aaron is not in the right space, especially how I'm set up, <laughs> all of that, you might as well counsel it all. And what one of the things that I do to prevent it is, man, I'll stay up late and I'll get up early for the me time. And the me time is really unique. Um, it's not, you know, it's not some ritualistic thing, uh, for sometimes it may be prayer. Sometimes it may be, uh, worship music. Sometimes it may just be, you know, something I'm going to get up early enough to own a part of my day before any other person, activity, energy has an opportunity to put his fingerprints on it and to take that. And so I think that, you know, we, they, you know, we talk about, these celebrities and these billionaires and we're wondering how they get to a place of uh of that type of status and you, you we hear that term but well we all have the same 24 hours in a day and so i we all know that health is wealth and so for me my mental health is is very important and so it's one thing to go after the bag and you have to have time to do that to provide and to live the type of lifestyle that you want to live but for me what really trumps all of that is making sure that I have that space carved out. And sometimes, man, if I can only own five minutes of my day, then I take solace in knowing that for those five minutes, I sat with myself, I sat with my thoughts, I was content, uh, content with that. And, and then it gives you the opportunity to be good for yourself so you can go out and be good for others. And but to the on the flip side of that, Josh, as you said, you know, after all these all these things have happened to you, you talk about going out, riding your bike, walking, doing these different things. Uh, don't don't give me don't get me wrong. Um, the fact that I have the opportunity to work out. Oh, boy, because it ain't nothing like and most 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 guys and women, too. We all can agree that when we have that, uh, that physical exercise ability to release tension, man. Um, it does something to you. I'm not going to use one clinical term because I'm that dude that's going to say the wrong word. And I, I see too many LPCs and MPAs and <laughs> RNAs on here too. <laughs> You'll get some hate mail next. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. But, but we know that it releases some good energy, man. Um, and so I, I just want to put that out there. Now, before I turn the floor over, man, all of you guys, Michael, Josh, Eric, you guys have said some really good things. And so I wanted to say something um, about this whole idea of trauma um, and kind of go going back to Eric's point around, uh, well, this whole panel, black man and trauma, right? I think one of the biggest challenges that we don't really address when we talk about, okay, well, we finally got to a therapist, someone of Eric's status, and we started to talk about our trauma. Most men um, have, I think the challenge is we have to, also identify or determine as black men, now that we're in the seat, which trauma do we talk about, right? And by trauma, I mean, even if we look at it from a time stamp or an era where we have past trauma and present trauma, a lot of times like Josh, Josh lost his business due to a freaking tornado, 12 years of his life gone like that. Well, let's just say Josh hadn't made it to a therapy session before. So now Josh finally gets in Eric's chair. Josh technically, whether he realizes it or not, has a lot to unpack from way back when, but he, but because those resources hadn't been available for us or the stigma that's around the idea of therapy for black men, Josh really doesn't get the opportunity to unpack, you know, daddy wounds and mommy wounds and childhood <laughs> trauma and ACEs and everything in between. Josh has to only address the trauma that is present that happened 12 days ago. 
So I think that that's, that's just one of the, the barriers that, that I think that we have to address because where black men fall on this, on this trauma spectrum and the idea of going to, to therapy, you know, it's, it varies. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a good question. Eric. So how, how do you, how do you rank your trauma? Like, how did you rank it in a way where like you address, do you address time stamp? Do you start in the eighties? Or do you go to, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you say it all started when the fat yeah, boy like, broke up, right? <laughs> yeah, like, bro, how, how, do, how do you rank the trauma? Like, that's a great question, Aaron, because I didn't really think about that. Because you you dealing with present trauma, you p- dealing with past trauma. So, like, what's the first thing that you get off your chest first? Is like, is it the, the present stuff? And then you dig deep into the old stuff that brings you back to the current stuff? Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, every one of my male clients that comes in and says, this is what I'm dealing with today. And through conversation, we, we, it just naturally comes out. You know what I'm saying? So in my mind, you want to, what's causing you the most difficulty in your life today? What's, what is the trauma that's affecting your daily functioning today? Let's, let's deal with that. And just through conversation. And when I'm doing it, like in our first session, I'm going to ask you, have you experienced any trauma in your life? I was shot in the, like, I'm thinking of a client this week. I was shot in the face. I was held at ransom. I was kidnapped when I was a kid. I grew up in a dope house. Like my mom wasn't, th- it just starts to come out. And then when you mm-hmm. begin to try to, I'm like, okay, which one of these do you want to deal with today? Or what, which one of these things is giving you or causing you to have the most um, dysfunction in your life today? And then we just start with that and we'll break down each one. Um, and here's a good thing to know that a lot of clinicians are really focusing in on is trauma-focused therapy. We know that most people are gonna come to us with some type of underlying trauma. There may be a triggering event that happened recently, but if we, we, it doesn't take long to realize that there are many other factors or many other experiences in the past um, that may be coming up as a result of the current trigger. And so I don't know if there's any uh, particular ranking um, of, of trauma, but you really want to start with what's causing you the most th- this uh, dysfunction today, process that, and then we can we can pick another trauma and process that as well. So I just go with whatever the client presents. I don't know what they're going to tell me. You know, I just, I'm just, I'm writing down all this stuff, you know, I'm just writing it down and they don't even realize the things that I'm writing down. And I'll say, you said, t- you told me that this happened when you were 12. And they're like, dang, that did happen to me. And I'll say, how's that affecting you today? And it's affecting them mostly in their adult, like the trauma that I've noticed. I and mean, I'm a human. I've had trauma in my life. I've lost people unexpectedly. It, it does start to affect your personal relationships. And so mm-hmm. when you notice that your trauma is showing up in your relationships, that's something that we want to start to pay attention to. So, Josh, I don't know, man. There's no particular rank. We just go with what, what you tell me. And then I just start doing my thing. And you talk. And I'm writing down things. And I may say, hey, let's, let's talk about this as well. So... Because there's lots of trauma, man. There's so much trauma. And the thing about trauma that we all need to understand, it doesn't have to happen to us Yeah. to be traumatic. Like Josh said, when you wake up every, every day and you see a man being killed, whether it's by the police or whoever, that's traumatic. You hear about a friend that was killed. That's traumatic. You think that something may happen to you. That could be traumatic. Almost robbed nearly died in the car. I mean, any of those things could be traumatic to you. And that's what we need to understand about trauma. It doesn't have to directly happen to you for it to be uh, traumatic and have an effect on you. Yeah, I, I thank you, Eric. Uh, I want to jump in because I, I, I actually have a question from Michael. You know, we're talking about, you know, actually being at, you know, seeing a therapist and making it to that seat, right? That comfy, that comfy couch. But my question really is, do you think that we have a successful go-to strategy that appeals to black men that will allow them or make them comfortable with even making it to someone like Eric's office. And I know we talking about stigma, but now I'm talking about like the social aspect, like how we, how we see it on social media, um, you know, how effective of a job are mental health professionals doing or just the mental health community doing in terms of appealing and marketing to uh, black men. Yeah, no, I mean that's a that's a great question. Um, I think the the short answer to it is is no, uh, and the reason I say that is because basically when you when you think about black men, you're talking about a group of the uh, a section of the population that for generations 
has basically had to live each day of their lives being reminded at every turn that they're not welcome. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, you know, what does that do to a person? What does that do to a community? You know, how is that, uh, you know, talk about, uh, I haven't heard the term generational trauma yet, but you know, th those pains and everything, those learned behaviors as a result of that pain can be, you know, passed down. And, uh, you know, when you asking me this, the first thing that I think about, I spoke with a doctor out in uh, Los Angeles a couple of years ago, and he said something that really just, it sat on me. And it's like, you know, sometimes you hear a little nugget of truth and you say, you know what, I'm going to go to my grave with that. You know, but I was talking to this guy and he said, basically, uh, he said, black men don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And when he said that, that just really sat on me. And basically what it was, uh, what we were talking about in the conversation was, you know, to Eric's point, you know, the historical references about Tuskegee and all these other things, what has the medical field, the medical industry done to show black men that they're a priority or that they care? And like when the, one of the things that I always notice, like when I travel and you go out of town and it, it's funny, like when I go to Atlanta, cause that's where I'm from, there are certain neighborhoods where you go through and you'll see a billboard. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it'd be like a HIV uh, billboard or something like that. And it'll have, you know, black and brown faces on there. And it's like, okay, of all the billboards that are in this city, I was like, I see cartoon characters. I see people with, you know, lottery tickets and everything. But if I was an alien and I dropped you and I dropped into this uh, city and I looked around just for visual references and the one reference that I see is a black man in a, very very dangerous uh disease like what the, what's the connection that i'm going to make you know and so i bring that up because i want to talk about like imagery and how that's important like we you you're not going to get black men to come into counseling just because you turn the open sign it's like we're going to have to go to them you know, we're going to absolutely have to go to them because basically you know when you're leading somebody to uh ultimately i think what we're talking about is trying to have a transformational experience right is, uh, is they have to be able to see themselves inside that solution. You know, so for me, I need to be able to see images of my brethren basically being the everyday recipients of the best things that America has to offer and not being cast off as a threat to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Because, uh, I mean... I deal with that. I mean, I try to combat that. I mean, I'm a black male. We're, we're like, we call ourselves like unicorns in this field. Yeah. <laughs> and um yeah i have long hair i'm just i just try to make it as relatable as possible and another thing that's important to know you know when i was looking for a counselor many years ago i wanted to see a black man like that was important to me yeah. I went to a white woman i saw a white man i saw a black woman i saw everybody across the spectrum and then when i got with a black male honestly that wasn't the right fit for me and so it's important to know that just because you find a, a black man that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the right fit mm -hmm. and so that's that's really critical to know you just got to find the right therapist and as a good therapist we're, our job is to build an alliance with you we know you're coming to us because you need help and so that's why i pull out i'm, I'm automatically addressing the stigma i'm automatically addressing hey i know this is what's going on in your life so that you can feel normal so that you can feel like like you, I'm, you're not, I mean, I'm the expert at what I do, but you're the expert at you. Mm -hmm. I don't know you like that. And so I need to build that alliance. And so I think that's, I don't know, man, I think Aaron, that's a good thing. As therapists, we have to do all that we can to try to reach black men. I have a podcast. I host it with another black man. We talk, we just have regular conversations. We put it out to black people. I'm a therapist that says, I want black men to come to me. I do come see me. I may not be the right fit for you, but Hey, let's start with me. And if it doesn't work with me, I'll, I'll help you find another person. I'm here for you. And I, and people say, maybe you shouldn't, uh, you don't want to just narrow, you know, limit yourself to only black men, which I don't, I have white men, women who bring their sons to me for some reason. They say they feel like they can relate to me more. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> fine. Bring it to me. But I don't have any problem, you know, promoting my services to black men because I want you to come. And I think we need to do a better job at that in the field all together. Like all therapists, if you're on here tonight, I think it's, it's important for you to really truly tell black men just straight up, Hey, come see me I, because I can help you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that sure. big connection with that also in the wellness space, right? Because you have a lot of trainers and you have a lot of this and, you know, and I think if we can get past the fitness part and, and fit, you know, in that mental space of that, 
they could be advocates as well of, of therapy for you because they have, they're in front of a lot of people, our trainers are. So if there's some type of connection there. I think that that would be another segue to get men, you know, on the couch. That's good, Ashley. Uh, just real quick, the word alternatives came up. And so here's the thing about black men, like we know how to get to everything that we want that that is marketed to us that, you know, we are, we're consumers. Uh, I see somebody on the call, you know, we need to be investors too, but, uh, we're yeah. probably, but, you know, <laughs> but, but we're consumers, right? So we know how to consume content, material, et cetera. And so that whole gym piece, Josh, I think brought up barbershops earlier, you know, the places that we, that we go, y'all still wash our own car, you know, the car wash, like all of those places. Uh, I think partnerships are like extremely important to paint the picture that there's an alternative, like working out is great and it's good for your physical health. Now the alternative to address your mental health, it can be in the gym, but here is a more, uh, I guess, clinical or, uh, more impactful approach to doing that. Let me shut up now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, hey I, I, listen, I felt me going over to that, uh, to that space. Yeah, and, and I just want uh, uh, two seconds before we uh, transition to the next question, but um, the imagery is really what's the thing that we have to figure out uh, because, you know, uh, white people have a certain image of black, black oh, yeah. okay? Uh, and Hollywood plays a part yeah. in that. TV plays a part in that. Like so much plays a part in the imagery of black men that that it makes it where everywhere we go is public enemy number one. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a suit, because I posted this on LinkedIn. I posted that I was in a suit. See, when I'm in a suit and a tie, I'm embraced differently than if I'm in sneakers with my ball cap and my, you know, my hat mm -hmm. backwards. And it's just, I hate that, but that's just how it is. And that's why I think back in the day when all the black men used to be really dressed up and really nice to make you feel better about yourself to say, Hey, mm -hmm. this man in this suit is not going to beat me upside my head. So it's like figuring out how do we shift the imagery? Uh, and the imagery is, you know, it's it's a lot of what we do uh, on ourselves, but shifting that imagery to not be where bl the black man is the the most hated man, or it's the it's every that's trauma in itself. It's like I can't even wear certain things, or I can't put a hood over my head at night because mm -hmm. X is gonna happen, or if me and a white woman get on the elevator, she gonna clutch her purse. Like it's just certain things, bro. It's just that imagery portion of it, like how do we shift that? Uh, well, you know, well, Josh, I would say, I think that, you know, the, when we think about like these, the systemic issues, we think about racism and, and which, you know, negative images is part of that um, machine, if you will. You know, I mean, that has put out all these messages and everything. And so the thing about racism is it doesn't hold up very well against contact. And so, like separation is what keeps it strong. So, you know, my personal belief and what I've seen in the last five years of really, you know, digging into, you know, my product, but then also just engaging people and trying to, you know, draw a circle really wide as far as building alliances is that we just have to engage people. You know I mean? It's one thing to sit back on my side of the fence and say, okay, well, this community does this, you know, and then you could be on the other side of the fence saying, oh, well, everybody over there on the other side of the fence, they do this. And we, and we're telling these, uh, we're, we're passing on these lies, we're passing on this in the innuendo and all these stereotypes, but they never, if we don't put them in a position to be challenged and put up for a debate, you know, it's like we can never dispel those myths. So what I have found is that there are a lot of people out here that want to have these conversations and everything. And so, you know, particularly with like the social justice stuff that's going on right now. I mean, I feel like there's a golden opportunity for us to just engage. And it's like, hey, have a conversation with, with the black man and just see that, no, we're not all monsters. You know, there are a lot of black men who have good jobs, who are awesome fathers, who are, uh, you know, community members and everything, you know, be able to challenge that narrative and just show and prove, you know, but as long as there are things that separate us, then I'm, I feel like, that's what's just going to continue to uh, to meet that. So it's like, it's kind of like fighting fire with fire. It's like, if there's all these uh, images like you're talking about Hollywood, where's the black Hollywood as far as being able to return fire, if you will? 
you know, till it's like, let's just flood the market with some other things other than brothers being, uh, you know, uh, dead you know, drug daddies. dealers, yeah, deadbeat daddies, or you know, <laughs> you know, the first to die in a scary movie, you know, all that great stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that's what we have to do. I mean, and I think that one of the things I love about looking at this panel is I see so many like people who are, uh, you know, putting content up. You know, it's like that's where it's got to start. You know, it's not one person or one industry that's going to do it. It's like we don't need one person to try to entertain a thousand people. We need a thousand people to take what they have to offer to the community and just go full force with it. That's excellent, Michael. Yeah, but uh, if I want to jump in right quick, uh, Eric, I did have a question for you. Right. Um, so let's just say I'm a brother, and I am. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Certified. Yeah. If Let's say, like, we were talking about sort of fighting through those stigmas and everything. So if I finally build the courage up to go and see a professional, like, what's that what's that journey look like like how do i find somebody like you and uh and to your point you were saying you know if you're not a good fit like what does the industry have set up for like referrals and whatnot yeah man uh that's another question that comes up a lot i think one of the most um popular and widely used resources is a tool called uh, psychologytoday.com um you can just type go to google put it in psychologytoday.com put in your zip code or the area that you live and you can just kind of scroll through. I like to call it like a LinkedIn for, for mental health professionals. Hmm. Um, this is what I encourage people to do. Pick out maybe three to four people that you would consider to go and see because their profile is there. Every issue that they would help you with is there. If they take insurance and all that, where their office is located, all that's on their profile. I would encourage people to pick out maybe three or four, call those people and uh, give them like a quick interview per se and say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. How would you help me deal with these issues? And then schedule the intake appointment. Like I said, it might not be the best fit, but the first thing that you have to do is you have to go and get in the chair. It's up to the therapist to exhibit their cultural um, relatability, mm -hmm. the cultural competence. That's why I said, as soon as you come, even when you first call a therapist, they are already kind of in the, we're already in the mode of therapy. So we're already starting to, you know, listen to your problems. And then when we meet you, we use what you told us over the phone. We do our intake. But the whole thing is about building a relationship. That's why I immediately, you know, recognize, hey, you're a black man. I'm a black man. How you feel? Does this feel weak to you? You know what I'm mm. saying? I'm immediately, you know, addressing those things. But I think the best thing to do, Michael, is to use a resource like psychologytoday.com. Um, there's another resource called Therapy for Black Men. Um, it's mm. a growing resource. It's not, it's, it's a growing, it's not as big as um, uh, psychologytoday.com, but it's a growing resource. Um, there's other, so what I'm realizing is that like the way my name comes up a lot is in Facebook groups. Just ask, Hey, I'm looking for a therapist in my area. Mm. You'll get any number of you know, people will just start throwing out names, plenty of names. You know what I'm saying? I think it's just ask the people that you're around. Um, for, for recommendations and usually that's a good resource but again you can use the widely known things like uh, psychologytoday.com or therapy for black men um, or you can just ask the people that you're connected with on on, on groups uh, what's the group in Nashville what's the group called uh, black business what's the big group black in people here? making moves yeah black people making moves my name comes <laughs> up a lot and I see my name coming up in lots of threads and lots of different lots of different chats so mm -hmm. just ask, really. Just ask people, and people usually make good recommendations. But just that sample. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. the first step is you realizing, I need the help. Now, that's the very first step. That vulnerability to mm -hmm. self, I need to go ahead and try to talk to somebody. Yeah, that's one thing I found is, like, that's the one thing you can't market around or negotiate around is that want to, you know. Yeah. So that's what I always tell people who want to come and work with me is that, you know, if you have if you want to, like, that's the only thing. You, I can take care of everything else around it and everything. But that yeah. desire piece, like, that's important. Uh, so just a quick follow-up. So we're talking about, because we're talking about Black men in particular. Is there, if I'm looking for, uh, looking for a counselor, is there a certain way or certain questions I can ask to sort of flush out and sort of figure out who's going to be a best fit for me? I mean... Well, for, let me say this. If you, have, if you are employed and you have insurance, then you more than likely have what's called an EAP, mm -hmm. Employee Assistance Program. You can call that number, uh, and they will give you a list of therapists that you can contact. And they'll, it's usually you get so many sessions at no charge. So I just wanted to throw that out there. But, again, when you're asking those questions of trying to find a good fit, 
I don't know if there's an exact question that you may want to ask. I would just say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm dealing with. How would you help me? You mm. know, and then you just kind of got to go from there, man. And um, it's not really going to make the connection until you get in the, that office. You know what I'm saying? Like you, yeah. may, you, you pay attention to the way it's set up. You know what I'm saying? Do you feel like they're genuinely interested in what you have to say? And I think that's just the best way to go about it. I don't know if there's a certain set of questions you need to ask up front, you know, that's, that are going to give you like a, all right, this is the person for me. I think you got to have time to sit with that person, get a, get a feel for their style of communication, and then just go from there. Yeah, Sounds good. I appreciate it. If I can just support that, uh, you know, I, I hadn't spoken on this, but, you know, I've had, and Eric, you know, I called him like a while ago, standing outside in the driveway, like, man, I need a black therapist, you know, like, so bad, you know, because I, I know that we're in a time where the some of these stigmas have come down and I was comfortable enough because cause it's Eric. I can talk to Eric. I know I can go and ask him that. And once I actually got a therapist and I did my sessions, uh, it was a black man that was really uh, important to me from a context perspective. So I didn't have to explain, yo, what up? Uh, you feel me? You know, just some, some colloquialisms <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that, that I have as a Southern black man. I didn't have to do anything. You know what I'm saying? If I said Jays, he knew what Jays meant. And now he, I went, you know, like blue, the blue Jays? No, Jays. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, but with all that being said, when you talk about, because uh, I'll just tell you from my experience, one of the things, uh, you know, and even, even talking to some friends, talking to my wife, I realized that, man, even Eric is, uh, he's a service provider as a therapist. Mm -hmm. And it's like going to the market. And I'm big on customer service. Like Smoothie King, I'm not gonna tip you just because you made my 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 shape. Like you you need to come with some come with that right energy for this tip. So I feel like we have options as well. So once we finally get in there, um, my therapist was cool. So I got it I got it right for that for that time that session for what I needed. But I was gonna treat him just like I treat anybody else providing the service. Mm -hmm. So if I if we get in here and you not we're not clicking. We're not on the same page. You telling me more about your problems than you hearing about mine. <laughs> you stay on your phone. Uh, you stay late. You know, you got all of these factors that really add up. And I think that it's important to, because a lot of times when we break these type of stigmas, then we go in as black people in general, but black men too, as like this, not the victim, but like lower than where we can't hold our therapists to the same standard that we will hold anybody else to. So I want to say, once you finally get in there for me, I was going to be ready to go if it didn't add up. And I'm thankful that it did. And, and I had a really uh, healthy experience. Um, so I just want to say that to the fellas listening, that once you get in there, man, like size them up. And if, if the conversation doesn't flow, if you don't think that they get it, then, then I think that you have to continue to pursue your search because you deserve that. And definitely pursue your search. Don't figure out reasons to back out the game you know what i'm saying yeah. so it's like you're going there you was like oh no that ain't for me man yeah i tried that that one time yeah <laughs> one time you got an excuse to back that out the game time. you know what I mean? like oh <laughs> man he man he was over there doing such and such man i ain't finna go to that man i ain't no need no therapy yeah man. the whole industry is suspect yeah, yeah. off of that one visit yeah make so. sure you like stick 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 yeah. with it you know what i'm saying like make sure you stick with it and and really you know, if that one is not for you, go and find someone else. But definitely, if you feel like you need it, definitely pursue it for sure. I have a quick question. Um, my name is Steven, by the way. Uh, just had a quick question on 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 the on that. Um, do you guys have a list of that you can put in the group me or or shoot to me via email? Because that's something I've been thinking about doing. Um, so I was wondering if you guys have a list or, or contact information for these people. Yes. Eric Capehart right here. There, no, but yeah, uh, I actually have a list. I have, I have a list of, uh, I think about two, we just compiled a list. I think we had about 20 some, 20 something black male psychologists, therapists, counselors. Uh, I'll share that list. Um, happily I'll share it. Okay, that'll be awesome. I'm I'm sorry too. I just joined I just joined this call. I, I apologize. No, no, it's all good, brother. You know, it's all it's all good. He with me. Um, <laughs> Eric, I'll make sure that, that I'll, I'll make sure that I get that from you as well so we can make sure that everyone on the call gets that along with all right. 
the content. Thank you so much. Uh, Ashley, I got a question for Mike. Can I ask him? A, yeah. Uh, Mike. Oh, look at the time. No, no, it's like, hey, no, go ahead. <laughs> what you got, bro? So, so Mike, you 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 um, specialize in like working with husbands in in regards to like I think your company is called Pro Husband, right? Yeah, I work with men in all stages of relationship, which is yeah, really so, important right now. <laughs> uh, like that navigation between uh, sharing with your wife. And being being able to be vulnerable with your wife, how how do you, what what's the approach on that? Because a lot of a lot of men don't feel comfortable sharing those deep dark secrets with their wife like that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And should they share those secrets, or should they, hey, this is a therapy thing, and I should only, you know, me and my wife should only be talking about just certain things. Like what what's that? How do you na navigate that 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 wife situation? Well, I mean, I think ultimately, I mean, when we're talking about like what's important to you, like the sensitive things that you that you carry around, like you got to take that to a place where you feel like it's going to be safe, you know. And so, you know, theoretically, you would think that your wife would be a safe place to to drop some of those uh, things and be able to have some of those conversations. But in some cases, that's that's not it, you know, and not because they're uh, they don't want to hear it or whatever, but it's just, you have to be prepared to have those conversations, you know? And so you would think that um, it's important to have that groundwork done like that. You, you create that safe space when you start your relationship. Like we start figuring out as we spend time together, okay, what can I trust you with and what can I not trust you with? You know? So uh, I think like for me, like I've got my, I call my wife, my battle buddy, you know what I mean? Like she's like, we've been in it, let's see, it was 15 years. Uh, a marriage for us in uh, April, you know, and so there's a lot of things that I can, I can say at this point, I can take anything to her. Now there were points in our marriage where I felt like I couldn't take things to her because of some of the things that we talked about, which was, okay, well, you know, I'm, she put, she has me on this pedestal as, you know, this, you know, her man, you know, who can do all this good stuff and everything. But if I show her this vulnerability, well, then does that take my stop down? You know, and so for, you know, you know how that ego gets to work and, you know, it's like, I can't sit up here and, and bring this to you and call myself a hero, you know, but then I say, I oh, well, you know what, I'm actually kind of weak in this area because for some people, when you show that to them, you know, you get a, you get a much different reaction than what you would think. So, you know, for me, I think that what's important is we have to figure out if you're, if you're not a safe space for those, uh, for those things about each other. It's like, how can we get to that point? You know, now if it's something immediate, then yeah, we need to go talk to the Eric K parts of the world because it is so natural for us to just take that stuff and stuff it and compartmentalize it and, and put it in the back. And so it's like, you know, if you had had some trash that stinks or whatever, you take it out and the, let's just say you put it in the back of the garage, you can't see it anymore, but the fumes are still there. Right. And so that's why it's important for us not to stuff these things. It's important for us to talk to, uh, you know, counselors and, you know, any forms that we have, because if we don't, that stuff starts to permeate all areas of our relationship, you know, but I mean, but as far as, you know, bringing it back to our wives and like, it is, it is tricky, but we just have to like, that's where that trust comes in, you know, and for us, sometimes we got to check that pride and the ego. Cause a lot of times that's the only thing standing in between us and the healing that we need from our wives, you know, because they're there, they want to support us. They're like, look, bring it here to me. But every time I ask you what's going on, you like, okay, well you use those famous clinical terms. I'm cool. I'm straight. I'm I right. like Eric, I don't know if you can define the clinical version of I, right, <laughs> but I'm sure it's not, <laughs> I'm sure it's being uh, misused and misapplied. <laughs> oh, man, it's probably, it's probably all kind of other words. Like yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sure there's a plethora of words that we could use <laughs> that are much more accurate. But uh, but no, it's uh, like for me, I'm really passionate about, you know, relationships and, and fostering that connection between a man and a woman, uh, because I've I know that when you can create a space where you're vulnerable, you can drop your walls down and she can drop her walls down. That's where the magic happens. And then that's when we have an opportunity to have something sacred in our relationships. So I know that was a lot. I hope that answered your question. No, 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 that's all good. I, just wanted, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I, I addressed that. I know I see some married men on this uh <laughs> on the Zoom call, so. And you have some wives on here too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got room for them too. <laughs> so I feel like this is a good time. I mean, 
Eric, we've been hitting you with a lot of questions. I mean, we've been hitting all of you guys with some really great questions. Um, Eric, this is your chance um, to ask any, any of the guys, put a question out there for our panelists. What questions do you have for them? I mean, it's, um, I could ask, no pressure here. Like, you didn't give me no pressure. But it's, uh, I'll just ask a, throw a softball out here for you guys. Um, it just kind of goes along with all the, <laughs> okay, Aaron Clapper, <laughs> all that we've talked about tonight. Um, what is it that you can actually do to help normalize therapy? Like, we all have our own networks, right? What, uh, what can you actively do to help normalize the whole idea of going to therapy as a black man and dealing with trauma? Yeah, I'll go ahead and answer that. I mean, I'll say that, you know, I think you just have to lead by example. Like I have a, uh, a group uh, that I do in my pro husband group. And, and that's one of the things that we had that I figured out with my program was that like, we need a forum where we can bring, come to the table and put all those things forward so we can talk about them. It's that safe space, you know, so the things that maybe I'm not comfortable talking to my wife about uh, in that moment, you know, we can talk about it in that forum. And so for me, I feel like we just have to promote it and just show it. Because if you think about it, you, everybody probably remembers this dynamic in class when uh, everybody's sitting there and the teacher asks a question and nobody wants to raise their hand, right? Nobody wants to be that first person to answer it and get it wrong, right? But then finally somebody, you know, uh, somebody, you know, mans up and raises their hand and answers the question, you know, well then the teacher asks a second question. Now 27 other hands go up and you're like, okay, where was that motivation before? You know, and so what I've seen in my in my work and in other forums is that a lot of times people are just waiting on somebody else to go first. Yeah. So for me, like the the guys here on this panel, like we're obviously all very motivated because we, you know, we spent money on training, we've invested in ourselves, you know, we got recording equipment, all this other stuff. We have platforms. So like we're visible, we have a level of visibility. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's just make this part of the conversation. And as that becomes more casual and it's not like uh, it's not like Black History Month that only happens one one time a year. <laughs> you know, if we have it more often, it just becomes part of just the everyday uh, uh, exchanges. Then I feel like that opens up the opportunity for us to get more people uh, on board and more motivated to, you know, be good to themselves and make an investment in themselves. Awesome. Hey, do, do we have any questions in regards to any any guys out there that have any questions in regards to this topic, whether it be therapy, whether it be all these other things, uh, we, we can go back and forth all day long with uh, us, but do y'all have any questions uh, in regards to therapy and trauma and all that good stuff? If you don't, all good. Uh, <laughs> you gotta let everybody answer the question I just asked, Josh. Yeah, okay, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> McGee, what can you do to help Oh, oh, you saying like we need to answer your question. My fault, man. Uh, <laughs> man, Mike answered it for everybody. But go ahead, McGee. No. <laughs> you know, well, <clears throat> Eric, thanks for that question, man. First of all, I, you know, some one of the things that has come to mind as you guys have been talking, I've been listening, is really just around model behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm thinking about contextually, um, the group me's, the Skype chats, the Facebook messengers, the Instagram, uh, all, all of these social groups and social networks that we're in uh, goes back even to that barbershop, man. I know you guys, uh, wow, everything I'm about to say is going to sound exactly like what Mike just said. <laughs> well, maybe Mike hey, but I'm saying, I can't say it like you say it. Come hey, on with hey, it. Hey, 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 you smart. <laughs> you smart, man. You went first. But let me put it into Aaron's terms, man. It's, it's all about like, you know, you think about your tribe, who's in your tribe, yep. right? And you think about your resources, who do you have the ability to touch? So you just do this compound interest with everybody that's on this call. And if we all, if, if we all leave this call and we all tell another five to 10 to 15 people about our experience on this call, whether it's a repost or a tag, then I, Eric, I really think that that's a part of us doing our job. So it's about modeling the behavior and then it's about amplifying our voices as well, you know, because I think about like men who are in fraternities, who are in other social clubs, like y'all, we talk about everything else. Yeah. We, we, we talk about everything else. 
right? So I think it is about that guy, that lone nuts. Uh, some, several of you all have may, may have seen that, that YouTube video or the TED Talk video where the crazy guy is going down the hill and he's kind of naked and he's kind of dancing and he looked all crazy by himself. And then, so that's the lone nut. But the movement starts or the momentum starts when that courageous second person follows mm -hmm. them. And I think that we have to identify, we got to be the lone nut. If we are the lone nut right now, we got to keep dancing and keep mm -hmm. shaking it until that courageous second person follows us and it becomes a movement. And we need to make therapy great. <laughs> Never mind. We need to make therapy great. <laughs> Great again. Make it great for the first time. We need to make therapy trendy. Yeah. That. We need to, but no, therapy needs to be trendy. Mental health is already trendy right now. Eric, I actually think that mental health professionals are in a, a prime position right now because you mm. know mental, the buzzword of mental health is it's buzzed. It's a buzzword. It's trendy right now. Now we have to do our part to like usher them to real professionals and not just something cool to wear on a t-shirt and mm -hmm. a cool hashtag. So, and to just answer, wrap the question up, I think we doing that, we do that. I'll do my part. I'm going to, I need to do a podcast with somebody on here, you know, talking about it to appeal to my audience. Michael, I, I'll take you in. I'm going to take Eric, he and offer, but. Um, hey, I'm always down, man. You know. I know. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, to your point, man, leveraging our platforms and Eric, I will, I'll continue to do my part, man. I mean, I, I know and I respect too many, uh, people who work in this field to literally help us live better lives. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, who didn't answer? Josh, did you answer? I, I answered what Aaron and Mike said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I say, um, well, you know, we just got to utilize our platforms for good. Pretty much like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. people, people want to be led. You know, everybody yeah. is not a leader and people want to be led. So if you are saying on your platform that, hey, Josh, I'm getting help, you know, and you may want to go holler at Eric because mm -hmm. he going to help you process through whatever you're going through. And I think people are listening to that. So it all falls to the tribe. You know, people listen to people within their tribe. So uh, definitely just continue to share that, you know, it's cool. Mental health is dope, you yeah. know. And what I'll do on my part is continue to use my platform to use you gentlemen to get in front of their wives so their wives bring them and the girlfriends or moms or sisters, whoever. Um, because like Michael said, it, it's that woman, that woman's touch every time. Every single time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, y'all, this has been amazing. I have enjoyed this. I mean, I was super excited from the moment that everybody said yes and wanted to be a part of this. This was super, super, super important for, um, for me and Josh to do and, and bring and start the conversation. And, I, and like they said, the conversation doesn't end. I'd like to take this moment now to have all of the panelists introduce themselves, um, let you know their contact information, where you can find them, make sure that you follow all of them because if I don't see workshops or forums or things being um, populated from their feed, I'm going to be poking like, hey, when are you having something? So, I, Aaron, let's start with, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I'll go. Well, Ashley, Josh, first of all, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, you know, I, I actually had to check myself because when I was invited to do this, you, you immediately think, well, what qualifies me to do this? And I find myself... I check myself because it's the same thing. It's the same qualifying factor that I try to present to men on my platform, which is fatherhood is dope. It's a podcast where my goal is to amplify the voices of, of, of men, amplify the voices of dads. And one of the things that I, I know to be true is that we all have stories to tell. And so, Michael, I appreciate that, that, that nudge, that endorsement when I said you answered the question and you said, but you can't say it like me. And I think that... Uh, that's, that's just a part of, that's my mantra, man. And so uh, I appreciate the opportunity. You can find me on YouTube. Y'all, stop acting brand new. I know y'all see all my stuff. So I need y'all to like it. I need y'all to share it. Do that stuff that you do when you find something you like. You screenshot it. You go and send it to your friend. You share it with your mama if she on Facebook, because that's probably the only place she at. So y'all make sure y'all do that, okay? Um, follow me on, on Instagram at Fatherhood is Dope, on YouTube at Fatherhood is Dope, and Facebook and all platforms, Fatherhood is Dope, man. We are, we are amplifying the voices of fathers. 
uh, sharing their stories, man. And um, it there there's I'm talking to dads all across the spectrum, whether you're a mm-hmm. single father, a godfather, a stepdaddy, uh, a married, divorced, you're, you're dealing with custody. And we're talking to dads that fall all across the spectrum. So um, it's not, you know, it's like, how many things can you talk to, to men about? You'll be surprised on all of the dynamics that fathers are, are going through. And so I would appreciate you guys tapping into it. Appreciate you. Awesome. Eric. Yes, sir. So uh, I am hanging out on uh, the socials uh, at Eric the Counselor. If you go to IG, just type in Eric underscore the Counselor. Um, that's where you can. That's where I spend most of the time that I'm online. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you just type in Eric the Counselor group page there. I'm also um, hosting a podcast right now. Um, it's the second podcast I've hosted. It's called um, Experience Mental Health, which is just a fun and entertaining lifestyle show. Uh, about improving your mental health. Um, my de- my co-host, Des Perry, is a young guy. We just get on there and we talk about mental health in a way that it's palatable for everybody. It's fun. You know, it's not like this high-level clinical talk. It's just two guys sitting here having a conversation. We interview our guests. We had Josh on. You know, we, we're just talking about everyday mental health issues. And so you can you can hear our show. Um, you can check us out. We started a YouTube page uh, in, like in December. So you can just type in Experience Mental Health, the podcast on YouTube. Um, you can subscribe to the show by sending a text message to 31996, put in the letters EMH, and then you'll be automatically subscribed to it. Um, you can also find the show on uh, IG at EMH now. Um, that's, where we're, that's where we're posting all of our uh, podcast stuff on uh, Instagram. Um, you can also just go directly to my website at ericthecounselor.com if you're interested in uh, having me be your therapist, just go to ericthecounselor.com and you can request an appointment there. I type it in the uh, the chat over there, Eric. Oh yeah, I got you, sure will. Yeah, Mike? Yeah, so I'm Michael Warren. I'm a uh, author and a speaker and a coach here based in Nashville. Uh, I am the author of the greatest book you've never read yet is uh, Marriage Declassified, a non-clinical and non-clerical answer to what am I getting into? I'm also, as of this week, the proud author of my companion workbook. It's the Pro Husband Companion Workbook. It is a supplement to the online curriculum that I developed with the uh, Pro Husband uh, program. Uh, so basically, you know, in a nutshell, my work is, cent- is centralized on one thing, which is giving you a giving men a professional strategy for the most important role of their life, which is being a husband or a mate. I work with men in all stages of relationships, so don't let the fact that you're a boyfriend you know, affect the, uh, affect you from subscribing to the program, because believe it or not, if you're a boyfriend, you're on the husband track until you mess that up. That's when you get demoted. <laughs> so, uh, but you can find me on the uh, social media at the pro husband. Uh, I also have a podcast myself. It's called the pro husband podcast that is on iTunes, uh, Spotify, Google play, uh, and Stitcher as well. Um, like I said, I just went through my books as well, but you can also find out the most about me at my website, which is www.prohusband.net. From there, you'll find all the background information about my family, about what I do, and also gives you the opportunity to uh, sign up and be a member of this growing community. So uh, again, Ashley and Josh, I appreciate this opportunity. This was awesome. And, uh, and yeah, everybody, please subscribe and sign up for everybody else because like, it's going to take the whole village to get uh, to get this country where we want it to be, you know, on all the levels, mental health, relationships, wellness, all that stuff. So uh, everybody keep doing what you're doing. I'm proud of you and you always have my support. Thank you. Don't forget fatherhood. There it is. Awesome. Oh, I got plans for you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> no, Aaron, can I'm you, sorry. I can spoke. you uh, Can you put that down in there in the group meet, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. do that right now. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, Ashley? I'll let you go and then I'll close and then we'll breathe. Yes. So um, again, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, everyone that's on here, if you're wondering who I am, uh, I'm Ashley Burke James. I am one of the co-founders of Triluna Wellness. We are an experiential wellness company here in Nashville. We specialize in three core services, which is movement, such as yoga, health coaching, and cooking classes which we combined into comprehensive wellness curriculum, events, and retreats for corporate and community organizations. Um, So yeah, you can follow us on triluna underscore wellness. Um, You can also 
um, visit our website at trilunawellness.com. We have a supper club coming up uh, at the end of this month on the 31st. We have a supper club every month and we created these supper clubs to start intentional conversation. That's how Josh and I met. We actually, back in uh, February, we already did diversity and inclusion. And so this supper club, we will be talking about allyship versus performative action. Our chef is actually on here. So I'm gonna give a shout out to Chef Cleveland who is going to be hooking us up with all the good food. But again, you can find us at trilunawellness.com and thank you all again. Awesome. Well, um, again, um, I am Joshua Mundy. Um, I am the co-founder of a new technology school called Pivot Technology. So that's what I've been pushing here lately, uh, trying to get more uh, minorities, in particular African-American people into tech. Uh, if you all know that the world is shifting and everything is going to be tech and if we don't uh, really get involved and get the skills that we need, we're going to get left behind. So uh, it's pivottechschool.com, uh, 20 week boot camps and data analytics and web development. From there, uh, we plan to place you on a job. So we have huge organizations that have committed to hiring our students. Uh, so if you're interested in tech, if you have a tech idea or uh, want to get in tech, go to pivottechschool.com. But thank you all so very much for joining joining us in this very important conversation. Uh, this is just, I think this is just like the first step. Uh, there's so many topics that we can talk about as black men. There's so much, so much that we can really dig into, but therapy is really one of them. And I think that's one that we need to embrace as black men to really uh, get that off of us, man. We have to find some way that we can express ourselves and get some of those layered traumas off of us so that we can live the lives that we want to live. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Uh, thank everybody for really uh, tuning in and really being a part of the discussion. Uh, please tap into the people or the panelists. Uh, Eric Capehart is a really, really good friend of mine. I, I've been knowing him before he was a therapist, you know, when he had Wait, all the King's men yeah. and we used to sit at Mount Zion and, uh, and you used to tell me about all your dreams and goals. And I, I'm really just, you know, you're my brother, you know, I really uh, just love seeing what you're doing. And Mike, I met you a long time ago and I forgot where I met you. I think it was at Olive Branch. And well, that, and I came to the shop. I came to the, uh, came, I came to the lab as well. Yeah. Sure did. Which, did Cause I was looking for a Yep. Mm -hmm. And then Aaron, uh, you know, and when we was putting this together, Aaron, your name uh, came uh, came to me, bro. Like uh, your name came to me because I, I feel like what you're doing uh, with fatherhood and really mm -hmm. showing that fatherhood is really an important thing in the black community is really so, so dope to me. So thank y'all so very, very, very much. Uh, we're going to end this. Eric, did you say something? I'm just rambling on. Uh, okay, okay. Awesome. So I think we're going to close this event with a breathing session and then we're going to log off. So uh, thank you all again. Thank you. All right. And with that said, you can sit back and relax. You can close your eyes if you choose to. If you want to turn off your screen, you can. But just get comfortable. And again, we're all just going to take a really big inhale in, filling up the lungs and the chest with air. And then just exhale, side out of the mouth. Again, big inhale in, filling up the lungs, the chest with air. And exhale, sigh it out. And on each exhale, just allowing the body to relax just a little bit more. Starting to let go of any resistance, any tension. Just scanning the body, starting with the soles of our feet, relaxing 
the toes, the ankles, relaxing the legs, letting go of any tension in the knees, the thighs relax, the hips. When we breathe in, we inhale to the belly, to the ribs, to the chest, it all expands with air. And then we exhale, the shoulders, the arms, wrists, hands and fingers, all relax. Relaxing the back, the neck, the throat, letting go of any tension in the face, relaxing the jaws, the forehead. Take a big inhale in and a long exhale out. And so when we breathe in, we inhale all of that stuff that we carry around. And then when we exhale, we release, we let go of things that do not serve us. Take a big, beautiful inhale in, holding at the top. And exhale, sigh it out, let it go. Two more breaths, inhale in, fill up. And exhale, let it go. Last one, together we breathe in, holding at the top. And exhale, we release, we let go. Again, we'd like to thank you for your time and your energy in this space this evening. The light in me recognizes and honors the light in each and every one of you. I hope you have a wonderful evening and we'll be in touch. Namaste. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you all. Have a great one. Thank you, everybody. Y'all have a great night. I love y'all, man. Thank you. <laughs> right. I love you, too. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank you, Josh.